And I think I need to start this presentation with a confession. And the first time people told me about the Art Sounds Case project, all these ideas related to sound, all the technological equipment, I was thinking, wow, these people are crazy. This was my first thought. Because as you'll see in my next presentation, my personal research based on experimental archaeology applied to rock art production. So at that time, I was focused only on the material dimension of rock art. I was not concerned about other aspects, invisible aspects related to rock art. And this quote from Newsman sums up very well my perspective at that point. I was interested only on the visual dimension of rock art. And it's comprehensive because the aesthetics of rock art tends, tends to be so impressive that you forget that there's a lot of other aspects that are related to rock art. Rock art is not isolated in the archaeological context, it's not isolated in the, the archaeological site, and it's important to have these issues into account. In acoustics, the sound is an important aspect of rituals and our cultural practice in every society. If we look to anthropology, we will see that anthropologists always say that there is no ritual without sound. Music, uh, dance, a lot of performances are involved in prehistoric behavior and probably in the production and use of rock art. And actually, if we look at ethnographic reports and we, we can find a lot of information uh, related to sound, relating sound and rock art. Spirits that make noises and sing in the archaeological sites, spirits that uh, make a lot of sound because they are uh, engraving their own images on boulders or uh, information about people singing doing, during rock art production. So it's quite important to have this dimension, this invisible dimension into account. And I don't know, let me see if I can, because I don't see now, okay. I don't know if I'm trying to dar play this audio, but in this mode of presentation, I think I can't. Ah, ah, não, acho que tá. Não. Não deu? Não. Ah, sorry. So, this is a normal sound in an archaeological site, for example. No? We can understand the sound, but if the archaeological sound, the archaeological site has a special acoustics, a specific acoustics, maybe you will hear this. And the way our brain interprets and perceives and interprets this stimulus is very different. We are talking about different emotions, different perceptions, and this can influence a lot all this cultural practice developed in the archaeological site, and especially in a rock art site. So, uh, the Art Sounds Kids project was created with this perspective. It's an adv ERC advanced grant led by Margarita Diaz Andreu with this objective to understand the role of sound and emotion in relation to the sacred in the rock art sites and landscapes of pre-modern societies. Of course, it's a challenge to work with this subject. So we have people working on archaeology, ethnography, psychology, and especially in acoustic engineer. And we are now working in four continents. We, we did a lot of field work in Mediterranean Europe and South Africa. Our last field work was in South Africa and Asia, in this si Siberia, and in, in, in North America, in Baja California, and in the United States. Okay. Come on. Okay. So the project is divided in six research lines. Of course, we are talking about rock art, physical acoustics, psychoacoustics, neuroacoustics, ethnography, and uh, le uh, the, our last research line tried to, uh, to bring everything together to work with the ontologists, different ontologists, trying to find information about indigenous ontologies. Because, of course, we will have a lot of data, but we cannot under interpret this data with our Western ontologies and to say, okay, this is how people in prehistory was perceiving sound. We can, of course, quantify the acoustic properties of sites, but we also need to understand how people could interpret this 
this stimulus in prehistory. And of course, a lot of researchers um, contributed to the project, uh, archaeologists, et ethnologists, uh, anthropologists, psychologists, and we have a lot of uh, work in progress, uh, masters, um, thesis and PhD thesis on the different research lines of the project. And of course, uh, here I need to, to tell you that the interdisciplinary approach is beautiful on the paper. But when you try to put this in practice, it's a challenge. I remember my first project meeting. After 20 minutes, I was thinking, what am I doing here? Angelo Farina is a well-known uh, ghost engineer. It's a rock star in the field was explaining some changes they were doing the methods. And I was thinking, wow, I can't work on this project. And then we, after some months, we, you understand and we can deal with all these issues and, and create a, a different perspective to rock art research uh, involving all these, these different fields. So how we work in the field, probably Sam will recognize this place. <laughs> this is a game pass shelter in South Africa. And we use a method called impulse response. Impulse response, a method where we reproduce a uh, omnidirectional sound in the site and try to catch the acoustic fingerprint of the space. This method is used, for example, to build concert halls or spaces like this. You need to take this into account. If you see, there's no reverberation in this room because in this room, it's not a good thing. If you have a lot of reverberation, we will have a terrible speech clarity. So this method is, people have been using this for 20 years for, for this kind of situation. But of course, it's a method created for closed spaces and you had a lot of work to adapt this to open environments. And then we use a dodecahedron loudspeaker and several omnidirectional microphones that give us information about the strength of sound, reverberation, speech clarity, music clarity, or the decay time, several aspects, several parameters, and especially the spatial, spatial behavior of sound in, in these places. And here, I hope you can see this is a time lapse and how we work in the field. So we'll do a lot of measurements, thinking about uh, different hypotheses. Okay, if, if people were doing a ritual in this place with a, with a collective ritual, for example, uh, the audience could be in this place. So we try this, we put the, the sound source in this place, then we move to the other side. We try to have a complete reading of the, of the possibilities in this side. So this is the omnidirectional sound. We have these impulse responses and this is the sign sweep we reproduce in the sound in the site. There's a five seconds delay. I hope it will work. Why this sound? Because we need quantitative data. We cannot just play music because we need to be, uh, we need to do a, a standard measurement. So this sound, is, this sign sweep covers all the frequencies that are audible for humans. So we can analyze how the brain respond to low frequencies, middle frequencies and uh, high frequencies in this place. So we have as a result, a lot of data incomprehensive data in the beginning. And you see here, for example, a comparison between Game Pass 1 and Game Pass 2. We have, as I told you, a lot of acoustic parameters you can analyze, you can compare this data, but this is acoustic engineer. And the challenge is to translate this data into archaeological information, into archaeological data. And then this is the, uh, the, the importance of the interdisciplinary approach. We can work together to transform this data in archaeological information. Of course, we, with that data, we can contrast a lot of, of, of hypotheses about importance. Okay, these sites with a lot of images could have an important, a special acoustics and maybe people were doing a lot of rituals here and that's why there's a lot of paintings. Maybe we have a, we, we can study a lot of different hypotheses relate only with this uh, specific acoustic the data. But of course, we want to understand the, the, the role and importance of emotions in this process. So we built a, this immersive psychoacoustics laboratory. There are just a few labs like this in Europe. And here, 
participants can have an immersive experience and we can recreate using a process called convolution, the soundscape of the shelter. So the person there and can be in the game pass shelter. We can reproduce the soundscapes and using specific stimulus, we can make people feel exactly how we feel in the rock art shelter. And then we, we work in, in this case with psychoacoustics and neuroacoustics. Psychoacoustics because we want to understand subjective emotions, what people are feeling, what are the, the first feelings people are, uh, uh, what, what people feel in these soundscapes. But of course, we, are, we have to take into account a lot of cultural aspects because it's different, probably it's very different, the perception of a sun hunter gathered and a uh, European 20 years old uh, student. So that's why we are using also neuroacoustics and we are using electroencephalography to analyze biological aspects that are not dependent on culture to understand how the soundscapes, how this stimulus affects the brain, what areas of the brain are activated or are stimulated by the soundscape of this specific site. So again, we are trying to we need to always bring everything together to make sense of the, all this data. And we are trying to materialize this invisible aspect, this immaterial dimension of rock art. And we have been publishing uh, a lot of papers. This is just as an example of some contributions we, we made in the last, in the last years uh, about psychoacoustics. We are also analyzing not only the acoustic data, but also dense representations, for example, that are give us indications that sound are present in this um, in the Levantine society, for example, in the Mediterranean Spain. We also published a paper about Baja California, or the work we did in Canyon de Santa Teresa, and we will go uh, back to Baja California on next um, two months. Uh, the work we did with a lot of ethnographic research in Altai, in Siberia, and our recent paper about the acoustics of aggregation sites, where we, we did this analysis uh, contrasting the acoustics of an aggregation site and 16 satellite sites located around this, this main site. And it's quite interesting, the results that we, we can see uh, the importance of, because this uh, site, this aggregation site we published, there's a lot of reverberation. And reverberation, it's well known because it's quite important for uh, to create co cohesion. If you want to engage people, to create effective engagement, it's very important for music performance, for example, the reverberation. So I think uh, I'm on time, right? <laughs> yeah, and this is how we are uh, working with this archaeology of the invisible. And we hope that in this way, we can have a better understanding of what was the, the meaning of, of rock art for prehistoric societies. Thank you.